It is my very great pleasure to introduce to you Faye Waddleton, a woman whose leadership and vision have won significant gains in the realms of health care, civil rights, and family. As president of Planned Parenthood from 1978 to 1992, Ms. Waddleton played a major role in defining the national debate over reproductive rights and in shaping family planning policies of governments all around the world. Continuing her support of equal rights for women, Ms. Waddleton now directs her energies toward illuminating the status of women in the United States as president of a nonprofit research and policy development institute known as the Center for Gender Equality. Created in 1995 to promote a national dialogue on the economic, political, educational, and health aspects of women's lives, the Center aims to expand the body of scholarship on gender equality issues and share this critical information with policymakers, the media, and the general public. Ms. Waddleton has made her mark in many arenas, as evidenced by her 15 honorary doctoral degrees and numerous awards. In 1993, she was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame. She is also the recipient of the 1986 American Humanist Award, the American Public Health Association's 1989 Award of Excellence, and the 1989 Congressional Black Caucus Foundation Humanitarian Award, to name just a few of the honors bestowed upon her. The Ford Hall Forum is particularly pleased to note that Faye Waddleton received the 1992 Margaret Sanger Award, as Margaret Sanger played quite a significant role in our own history. When Sanger was scheduled to speak at the Forum in 1928, the city of Boston received a restraining order barring her speech. Refusing to be censored, the Forum presented Sanger on stage, her mouth taped over, while Arthur Schlesinger Sr. read her words. Thankfully, no tape will be necessary this evening. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, with great pleasure, I give you Faye Waddleton. <laughs> Thank you. It's also my pleasure to um, express my appreciation for the invitation to speak at the Ford Hall Forum this evening and to follow in the footsteps of the grand uh, women and men who have had the privilege of speaking to such a prestigious forum. Um, it seems that I've been in Boston a lot lately. Um, some of you may recall that I was here in the fall um, promoting my book, Life on the Line, and when I was invited to come to speak to this forum a couple of months ago, uh, it reminded me of a story that was told uh, about an exchange between George Bernard Shaw and Winston Churchill. And Mr. Bernard Shaw um, wrote Mr. Churchill a note inviting him to the opening night of one of his plays, and he said, bring a friend if you have one. Um, <laughs> Mr. Churchill, not to be outdone, wrote back saying, I'm terribly sorry that I cannot uh, attend the opening night, but I would be delighted to have tickets to uh, the second night if there is one. Uh, so I'm really delighted that there was there is another night in Boston uh, to talk about issues that are very near and dear to my heart and my career, uh, and that is women and our status and what the future holds for us, uh, where we are today, and what needs to be done in the future to preserve the gains that we have made. In reflecting on the status of women in preparation for this uh, evening's conversation with you. I recalled an old Chinese curse that wishes that one's enemy lives in interesting times. Now, there are a lot of reasons to pronounce these times as interesting for women, but I'm not willing to surrender to a curse because I think that they also offer tremendous opportunities for women. I think that they can really test our, our resolve as a democracy and freedoms of equality and to redouble our commitment to assure that women participate in every aspect of our society. Now, this is at the same time that some have pronounced the political environment so regressive and so um, um, restrained and so conservative as to uh, be hopeless for making any real gains on women's issues. But I think that we have to take responsibility for what happens. And that is whether we will look back on this as a time uh, in which we advanced women's potential and the struggle for equality, 
or whether we allowed a renaissance of a subtle form, uh, more subtle forms of exclusion, um, lost ground on the battles that have been won, and fewer rights than we have today. And I don't think that it is, it is really hysterical, as you will hear in my prepared remarks, uh, to conclude that women are in danger of losing very fundamental rights. Um, the battles are perhaps not as well and clearly defined as they have been in the past. Uh, certainly the elimination of discriminatory laws and the battles to do that are far more clear-cut battles and the enemy is much clearer than perhaps some of the debates that have to do with late-term abortion, for instance, or other policies that may not be explicitly clear as to their implications. And so I think that the question before us is whether at the end of the 20th century Will women see enduring equality, and will we recognize that our rights are still being contested, or will we give in to the extremist elements that were never satisfied with the gains that women made, were never happy that women entered the workforce in unprecedented numbers in the 50s and the 60s, and have always been very disturbed and fearful of the changing status of women, the redefinition of our roles in society, and the fear that comes with a lack of clarity as to what our roles are. Will we allow the substitution of a religious polity for a secular political system? And more important, and I certainly worry about this with respect to my own daughter, whether the next generation will enjoy the same rights that I and the women before me fought for and that too often the women and men of the, of the future generation, of the current generation, take for granted. Now, has been, as has been the case in the past, many of these battles have been pitched over women's rights. And for that reason, I, I have, in my prepared remarks to you this evening, taken a perhaps harder edge in the theme of this, of this talk with respect to what women must do. It does not mean to suggest that I exclude men or do not believe that men have a very important and crucial role to play, but it does mean that I believe that women have got to take greater responsibility for what is happening to us than we have in the past. I believe that we can no longer accept that others will do it for us. Women cannot protect our rights because these are rights that are contested we have achieved gains toward true equality. And unless we recognize what is happening and take responsibility and responsibility and leadership for that, we must take responsibility for the losses that we are certainly sustaining. And when I say sustaining, I don't mean to be sustained, but that are already sustaining. Now, what are some of the barriers to our taking responsibility? Well. I think that one of the very simple ones for, for us is to look at why there's so much fear of really assuming our powerful role in society. It's easy to say, well, someone else won't allow me to have power, and someone else um, must grant me the power. But I hope that we will come away this evening with a sense that we all have the power within us to create change. Uh, but that deeply embedded in our system of values is a fear and a distrust of women and power. Now, when I say that, I don't mean a fear and distrust among men, but I think that within our own selves, we really do have a lot of difficulty in handling and assuming the role of powerful people or powerful, powerful women because it brings to mind strength and force and authority these are all characteristics that are most often associated with men. Men are entitled to power. We worship powerful men. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to ask you not to take more pictures. I have a retina detachment, and that's blinding me. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Um, we, we have the, the, the characteristics of power, of strength, and force, and authority. These are all characteristics that we associate with masculinity. We, we think that men are entitled to that power. In fact, if we look at what goes on in Washington today, um, it seems to me that it, it's a qualification 
to hold public office, that there is a hubris that comes with the more powerful, um, the more, more um, attractive the political figure is. And yet for women, and I travel a great deal around the country, uh, the stigma that still goes with a sense of powerful causes us to shrink a bit from taking on the role and to taking on powerful roles. We're conditioned not to display aggression. We, in fact, train ourselves and go for special help to learn to be assertive, not aggressive. We are so uncomfortable with the image of powerful women that it seems this idea of feminism uh, connotates power that frightens us. And the very idea of fighting for women's equality in many circles has fallen into disrepute. But I think that there are real dangers if we succumb to these ideas, because I think that women have the power to create change. We already possess it. We are 52% of the population. Statistically, we are in a powerful position. Psychologically and sociologically, we have to step up to the responsibility. And when I say stepping up, it means from looking at the, the continuing struggle for economic opportunity to workplace reforms, from health care reform to welfare reform, from educational opportunities to breaking the barriers that prevent women from truly breaking through the glass ceiling and achieving top-level leadership positions in corporate and political institutions and governance institutions of our society, from choosing whether or when to be a parent to being protected from assassin's bullets when we enter a health clinic or a family planning clinic. All of these are very heavy burdens that still weigh very dispro uh, disproportionately on women. And so the power of politics, I think, for the foreseeable future will be a major forum uh, for many of these issues, if you, if you consider what's going on with respect to uh, workplace reform, health care reform, welfare reform, the reproductive rights debate, and the struggle over the right to control reproduction. And so politics will dominate the boundaries of the power and the choices of women for the foreseeable future. And that is why I believe that we have got to influence the political institutions of this country to a de greater degree than we ever have. And I think that there is an opportune moment at this time to do so. Because for the first time in the history of this nation's major parties, 54% of the Democratic Party is, is made up of women, and 53%, believe it or not, of the Republican Party are women. Why, I guess we could ask, is a part, are parties made up of women in the majority, and yet they have policies? and activities that do not reflect women's concerns is a question that we really need to raise over and over again. In the 1996 election, women voted for Bill Clinton over Bob Dole by a margin of 53 to 37 percent. So when I say that we already have power, I, I think that this is a reflection of those gains that have been made. We are in the majority. We do have the power. Do we exercise it? Do we understand how to exercise it? Now let's look at what women were saying in 1992 against the reality of our lives. Uh, in the election, at the end of the election of 1992, women put jobs and economic opportunity at, their, at the top of their list of priorities. 26% said that this was the most, these were the most important issues to them. 14% said that health care was the most important issue. And then 12% said that crime and another 12% said that education were their priorities. So if we assume that within these categories, the majority of women are certainly the priority of jobs and economic opportunity is really at the top of the list for women, why are there not greater debates and efforts and efforts being put into policies that address these issues for women? Nearly a, a half of the, over a half of the women surveyed uh, in the exit polls in, in 92 cited unequal pay as a problem. Um, they knew, at, at least 44% of them said that they knew someone who had experienced a situation in, when, in which they were not paid on an equitable basis. And after economic opportunities and jobs, health care 
became the most important issue for women. And yet we saw the effort to try to reform our systems of health care go down in flames. Um, and now remaining are a large proportion of our population that either do not have adequate health care uh, coverage or have no health care at all. Seen as appealing as an appealing so solution to the struggle, to some of the issues around um, economic opportunity, 58% um, of all women would prefer a job with flexible hours to a job that requires them a regular work week. And even though American women support their families and they see their families as the chief source of their support, they also find the demands of family and work a very difficult burden to carry. And still we have no national debate on what there can be in terms of family policies and workplace policies that can ease the burden on women who are in the workplace. Now, I suppose Mr. Pat Robertson would say, well, this can all be solved if women will just go back home and do what they're supposed to do, which is to take care of the home and the family. But that really does fly in the face of a historical reality that is not going to be reversed and a failure to look at what, is, what realistically has happened in our country since the early 1940s. In the early 1940s, there were severe labor shortages that were caused by and created by the war effort and the demand for women in the workplace as men went off to war. By 1944, 5.2 million more women were working than in 1940, increasing from 28% to 38% of women of working age. After the war, some of that demand dropped but contrary to popular belief, where the image of, of the Ozzy and Harriet family, where, uh, where Harriet seemed to do nothing but, but, but uh, wear an, an apron and stay in the kitchen, women did not leave the workforce altogether. There still were gains made in women's lives toward, the, toward working outside the home. And in the 1960s and 70s, the influx into the workplace accelerated. Now, there were several issues, social issues that were going on at the same time that helped to propel that. Certainly there was the feminist movement that was calling for equal treatment of women and giving women choices um, about what they could do with their lives and that their lives were not just circumscribed by the role of homemaker. And that also did not mean that their lives were just circumscribed also in a career role, but that women would have the choice to either be a homemaker or to have a career. At the same time, the civil rights movement was well in stride, and the civil rights movement raised the nation's consciousness about unequal treatment of blacks, but also of any sectors that have been held in secondary roles. So we have a confluence of the women's liberation movement with the civil rights movement raising a national debate over many of the issues that have now fallen to some degree under attack and in some quarters into disrepute. At the same time, birth rates were declining. Now, whether that was because women were entering the workforce or whether those birth rates were declining so that women could enter the workforce is subject to some debate. But perhaps even greater than all of these, for the individual woman, we were seeing higher levels of education for women as we were achieving a higher level of education, we were also moving to fewer children and having smaller families. But at the same time, the economy was expanding. There were more jobs. But what were these jobs and what were the real opportunities for women as we entered the workforce? Well, whatever the opportunities were, by 1994, three of four women between the ages of 25 and 54 were in the workforce. Now, that's three of four women of working age or of in, the, in the broad spectrum of women who are working are in the workplace. That is a historical shift that cannot be reversed. But historically, women's place in the workplace have been, or there are places in the workplace, have been conscripted. What happens? We see that women are, by and large, confined to clerical positions. Women are still not prepared for careers in engineering, physical sciences, and the computer sciences. 
It is true that about half of medical school admissions now are among women, but we still largely are underrepresented in the sciences and in the technological fields, the fields of the future. Women with a high school education still can um, receive or still do receive about 73% of the compensation or the wages of their male counterparts. And if they have a four-year education or four-year college degree, that number increases by to 77%. Women working have a less likely, are less likely to have health insurance than do their male counterparts. A woman who works full-time year-round um, in the current minimum, under the current minimum wage uh, structure will not make enough to keep her family above poverty level. And yet we have a national debate over welfare reform that will not allow women who cannot earn wages above poverty level to get assistance after a certain period of time uh, through the public mechanism. So these are some of the issues that are major burdens on women's shoulders. Overall, 54% of women with children under five work. Where is the national debate on the issues of daycare? How do women cope if we consider the, inequ the continuing inequity in compensation and the lack of, of opportunity in many fields? How do women cope with the critical issues of child care? 73% of women who have children between the ages of 11 and 18 are likely to be employed. Now, I know that I have one daughter who is, is older than 18, but um, having lived through the years of, of being a working mother, ultimately a single working mother, and the burdens of balancing the demands of career with those of child rearing, um, and I had the resources to purchase child rearing. I think we can get a sense from our own personal experiences about how difficult it can be when there are really no major public facilities for children to receive adequate and consistent child care that will assure that women can pursue career opportunities in the workplace that will assure an ec economic security for their families. Even though there are these continuing disparities, American women in polls over and over again do say that they firmly believe that their lives have improved. A large majority of American women, 74%, believe that they are better off. Um, and half of them say that they believe that they would be even better off if there were greater representation of women in the political arena discussing these policies and these issues so that there can be a more coherent policy to address them. In 1996, women at the exit polls, now I told you about 92, and 96 women in the exit polls said that they were sort of like the rest of the country, feeling a little disgusted about politics. Seven in 10 of the women who were polled opted for a negative term. 17% they were of those seven in 10 said that they were frustrated, or 16% said that they were disgusted and another 14% said that they were disillusioned. Fewer than two in 10 women said that they were hopeful about the political process. And yet, there was, a, there was the sentiment that if more women were involved in the political process, where national policies are set, that some of these concerns could be adequately addressed. What do they want? Well, women said that they wanted an opportunity to have policies that addressed family issues. Almost two-thirds of them said that they preferred that over a balanced budget. They were especially concerned about the health of children and, the, um, and, the concern, and, and also concerned about older Americans. Now, maybe that has to do with the fact that the majority of women in this country are coming into the more elderly years, certainly the middle years of those of, those of us who are of the baby boom and, and during that era. So the, the experiences that we confront are likely to be the ones that create the most attention for us. Now, what has happened in the meantime politically? At the same time that I have painted for you a profile of the changing uh, uh, practices of women and, and the changes that have gone on in our lives with respect to workplace issues um, and the policies that need to reflect those changes and that need to address the support systems that women 
need in order to carry out these dual responsibilities more effectively. What have we seen? Well, we see now a national government that is certainly very divided uh, politically on the issues that are of real centrality to women. We see a Congress that is more ideological antithetical to these concerns than in recent memory. The makeup of the current Congress, the 105th Congress, I believe spells even greater difficulty in the years ahead. I ask again, how can this have happened when women comprise 52% of the population? What does this ideological shift pretend for us? Well, one of the major national policies that have created opportunities for women are our national affirmative action commitments at the state and the federal levels. We have seen at the state levels, at the state level, efforts to weaken affirmative action. It is in the context of minorities that are perceived as unqualified taking jobs and positions from whites that are more qualified. But if we look a little closer, we will see that affirmative action has perhaps played a greater role in advancing economic opportunity for women than have any other recent policies that relate to economic opportunities. Although 95% of senior managers are white men, and women still do not earn on an equitable basis, arguably without affirmative action, the gains that we have made would not have taken place. We are also engaged in a major debate over welfare reform. In the last Congress, a bill was passed that was largely a confluence of poverty and women and sexuality. Now, there is nothing that gives lawmakers greater um, thrills, I think, or greater um, um, interest than to talk about the sexual practices of the poor. And if you look at the welfare reform bill, within it is a very clear and strong message that the process of, of the government supporting poor, the poor really must not in any way support poor people enjoying their sexuality and making reproductive decisions that might have to, might result in the larger society supporting that lifestyle. So if you're poor and you want to have children, what the government is saying now, you're on your own. And if you're poor and you're not well educated and you don't have skills, if you don't get yourself some skills in the next five years, you're on your own. Where will these jobs come from? Where will women turn when they have small children and they need child care? and they do not have the means to support themselves and their children as they try to go out to earn a living, to have a, a subsistence life. These are all issues that are very, very heavy on the shoulders of women. But then, why can we expect sympathy from the same people who get elected on the, bird, on the message that women are responsible for a lot of the breakdown and the so-called traditional family values? that we are responsible for um, promiscuity, for sexual promiscuity, despite the President's vow to uh, do something about the welfare reform bill, the so-called welfare reform bill. I believe that the President's own problems with respect to the various gates that he has to deal with will largely preclude him from really making any change in the law that was passed by the prior Congress. Women are required to divulge the identities of the father of their children or face penalties, a requirement that could invite an abuser back into a woman's life if she has been able to escape. And with up to 92% of poor women experiencing severe physical or sexual abuse at some point in their lives, this is not an insignificant issue for an, ex for an example. If we look on the reproductive rights issue, down to a much more personal and perhaps more politically charged area. The dangers are formidable. You in this audience have come of age, by and large, at a time when you had the right to control your sexuality and your reproduction. Those gains and that those rights were achieved through a number of court decisions that established the constitutional protection to make that choice 
and they were achieved as a result of the sacrifices and battles that many were, were committed to waging to assure that each of you have the right to control your fertility. And yet there is a hard core in this country who are determined, who perceive that power within a woman's hands to be unacceptable and are determined to reverse the progress and to restore women to a status in which the choice is not theirs but belongs to someone else, namely the government or review committees or individuals independent of their wishes. We have elected a hardcore anti-reproductive rights Congress. We seem not to care about our most personal rights in voting for people to run our national government. Fifty-one of the Senate are now solidly anti-choice members. The only 35 are solidly pro-choice. We are coming up on a number or proportion within the Senate that could be a veto-proof Senate. In the House, the anti-choice flank is even stronger. 221 are anti-choice, and only 145 are supporters of a woman's right to choose. How can this be in a country that is comprised of 52% women? What does this mean for women, not only in this country, but in developing world countries. Well, what it means is more and more restrictions on family planning programs. It means a cutoff of international funding to developing nations for family planning services. It means crippling restrictions that will require family planning programs to report to parents when young people come into the to family planning clinics. And of course, the most pitched and heated debate is over the late-term abortion issue that is a, a debate that is the most tragic of all of the efforts that have been employed on an incremental basis to gradually erode the right of choice. For the late-term abortion debate is nothing more than a strategic effort to deny all women their choices. It seeks to attack the most tragic circumstances that women find themselves in and it characterizes women in the most deris derisive terms that a woman at six or seven months pregnancy will just out of convenience decide one day that she wants to terminate her pregnancy and her doctor would be denied the safest measure of doing so but would, res would have to resort to a measure that is far less safe and one that could really kill her. And so these are not issues over the fetus per se, I believe. I believe they are issues of power. Who gets to decide and what are the rules? Well, as politically difficult as these issues are for women, I can see them only getting more difficult. Pat Robertson promised, and I quote, an organized effort beginning next year. Conservatives in the party are going to have to coalesce very early and basically select a candidate we're not going to sit by as good soldiers. Um, we will, we're not consulted. They don't believe in this campaign. In the 1998 campaigns, they have vowed to be even more effective. Now, this is the same gentleman who declared that the feminist agenda is not about the rights of women. It is about a socialist, anti-family political movement that encourages women to leave their husbands, kill their children, practice yeah. witchcraft, destroy capitalism, and become lesbians. <laughs> These are the forces that women's rights are facing. What do I think it will take? Well, as I've said earlier, I think it will take the exercise of our power, all of us together, working hand in hand, men and women, but more precisely, women understanding that we have that power and we've really got to exercise it. It also takes a few characteristics that I found in an excellent book, Women in Power, The Secrets of Leadership. Dorothy Cantor and Tony Bernay describe a leadership equation. They say that a leader must be competent, must have a competent self, and must also be creatively aggressive. And they define the competent self as one that doesn't have to change the way she acts to please the people around her. 
and this enables her to promote the principles she believes in, even though she risks dis disapproval. And a competent self also, they believe, enables a woman to see the possibilities instead of the obstacles. And they describe creative aggression as taking the initiatives, leading others, speaking out. Um, I've already told you that aggression is threatening to some people, so even they couch it in terms of being a little creative with that aggression. Now I'd like to talk to you a little bit about my career and how I see that my life has fit into this equation. Because as I look back, I'm very happy that I had people who demonstrated creative aggression as my role models. Um, I am the daughter of a fundamentalist minister. That is not a fundamentalist minister father, a fundamentalist minister mother. And when I think of my mother, I think of Sojourner Truth, who uh, chided the early women's liberationists in the early part of the century at the first uh, meeting of women's rights, first convention of women's rights, when they were debating whether they would be allowed to own property and wear pants in public. And she said very impatiently to them, she was said to have said, there's some dispute as to whether she really said it, but at least the biographers said that she chided them and said, I just don't understand what all this debate is about. If women want more rights than they got, why don't they just take them and not be talking about it? Well, I think my mother was one of those, is one of those women, that she did not perceive her gender as a limitation to entering a profession that had largely been hostile to women, a religious establishment, a religious leadership role. But then she, show, she showed very early in her life that she was capable of having a competent self when at the age of 16 on her parents' Mississippi farm, she decided that she wasn't going to pick cotton another day and that she put her cotton sack down, returned to her home and sat down, informed her parents that they could beat her every day if they pleased, but she wasn't going to pick cotton. She declared her liberation from the cotton field. Now, her parents could not allow this to go on among their eldest daughter and among eight brothers and sisters. So they sent her north where she received uh, her education. She completed her education and at the age of 17, she entered the ministry. Now I think that that was a very precocious example of a competent self, but she believed that she had heard a calling from God to religious service. By the 1950s, when other women were leaving the factory or going into the workplace, my mother and my father and I were hitting the revival circuit, the tent revival circuit. I suppose we were the forerunners of the Pat Robertsons. But we went from city to city with my mother preaching the gospel, and she preached it to me and to my father. My father often slept, and I found it a very impatient life. But at the end of it, I... Uh, at the end of her sermons, I would rush to the altar and ask to be saved, and I would join those who were asking for, for forgiveness to God of their sins, and I wasn't sure whether I had sinned or what my sins were, but if my mother said that I needed to be saved, I should be saved, and I got saved over and over again. It never, ever quite took, um, but I did learn a lot about the riveted power of her message to persuade, and her Stand and her message was very clear, and it was not determined by the approval of others, but by her belief and standing up for what she believed in. So I think that her, she is a role model, and her life was an excellent example of the competent self, of her very principled beliefs, and accepting those beliefs and projecting them to others. Her creative aggression was channeled, perhaps much to my father's dismay, in some of the places that we landed. We traveled through the pre-Civil Rights South. My mother very often uh, condemned racism and segregationism in her sermons, and sometimes that resulted in some pretty frightening experiences for us on the road. Uh, my mother making statements that could have gotten my father lynched. Uh, but she was creatively aggressive in that she held up the Bible uh, as the word of God to defend what she wanted, to, what she was speaking, uh, and her message. But apart from the very strong, structured religious background in which I was reared, was a profoundly powerful woman shaping my view of the world. 
She did what she wanted to do. She didn't speak about it a lot. She didn't proselytize what she wanted to do, although she certainly was strong about her messages. But her mission was not filled with obstacles. It was filled with possibilities. At an early age, I think I tested some of those possibilities, much to her consternation, uh, not the least of which was that entering nursing school at the age of 16, I saw a world that was unbridled by my parents' religion and that was tempered by the experiences of life through a different prism, the life of the sick and the suffering. And that I learned that not everyone was evil who did not believe as I had been taught, and I was faced with more earthly conditions of suffering and death. Um, my revolution took place in the belief that I did not have to make judgments about other people's lives and other people's values in order to work for a society in which we would all be able to hold and share those values. My patients, if I was to be true to my profession that I was learning and the craft uh, that I was, was, was growing to know, my patients needed my care. They did not need my judgment. It didn't matter to me eventually what their values were, although I had been taught over and over again as a child that if you did not exhibit certain lifestyle patterns, you were evil and you were consigned to certain fire and brim brimstone. But that care and compassion was not conditioned on God's will, but on the effort to heal. Now, my time and my journey ultimately led me to a path that took me a very, very long way from that fundamentalist upbringing, but not so far away that I don't understand a lot of the elements that are, have been inject, injected into politics and that now influence the debate on women's issues. During my journey, I saw lack of many opportunities for the poor, and those poor were more often women and the poor were more often minority women. I'm old enough to have been trained at a time when birth control was not widely available, when health care was often denied the poor, when abortion was illegal, and when the burdens of unwanted childbearing were too often tragic and, Ill, and we were ill-prepared to cope with them. My graduate clinical preparation in midwifery was yet another step in that journey. I had the experience of training in a large urban hospital in New York, Harlem Hospital, and it gave me a view through the windows of poverty and suffering. It gave me a view through the windows of the lives of people who have very little, if any, from points from which to start. And so when we hear this idealized concept of people simply pulling themselves up by their bootstraps and going on to create a life for themselves. Yes, that may be true for some, but there will be many, many who, can't, who do not have the resources, who are not educationally prepared, who do not have the cultural context in order to function fully and, economic, and to have economic independence. I cared for women who were having their seventh, eighth child, they sometimes had no clothes to take their children home to. They had sometimes would dilute the formula in order to stretch the, 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 the uh, nourishment for their children until they had the resources to buy more. I cared for drug abusing women. And it would have been easy for me to simply say, well, look at me. I am making something of myself. What about them? Why can't they do better? And yet I realized that I had many opportunities that they didn't, and with those opportunities came a tremendous obligation. I saw the tragedies of unwanted pregnancies and the hopelessness of teenage pregnancy. I cared for young women who were only children themselves when they were having babies. I cared for a 17-year-old who died as a result of her mother's attempt to end her pregnancy by injecting a combination of bleach and Lysol into her uterus. She paid for her life, with her life, for this aggression, and yet there was no help for her because at that time it was illegal for a doctor to terminate her pregnancy. And so my journey has been one in the development of my competent self and my commitment to a creatively aggressive effort on behalf of women it comes from a, not from a theoretical base, but from one of experience, from the seeing of, what, of how people live and the struggles that they have. 
And it was during those years that I developed a deep sense of intolerance for the conditions that so often blight women's lives. And it's for that reason that I speak so passionately for the need for women to get involved so that we don't go back. My personal journey as a, as a leader evolved from these real experiences. And I was really very privileged and lucky, I consider myself, to have been called upon to become a leader in the reproductive rights movement as a result of my interest in midwifery and women's health. It was during those years that I saw that there was something that I could do to prevent the suffering that I had seen in the earlier part of my career. And I really feel that I'm getting to be sort of an old lady, that I'm now preaching the gospel of let's not go back, uh, that we have enjoyed a period in which women have had these rights. And I suppose it is a lesson in history that if we are not vigilant, we are bound to reverse ourselves. But as I heard my mother repeat her message over and over again, I believe that an important element of creative aggression is to be constant always in the message and not be tempted to compromise. We can't compromise on the fundamentals of our freedoms and opportunities. So I had a lot of great experiences as the leader of the pro-choice, of the largest pro-choice organization and the oldest pro-choice organization. Perhaps the high point and, perhaps, and, and even may the mo maybe even the most symbolic point of my leadership was an encounter that I had with Jack Wilkie, who was at that time the president of the National Right to Life Committee. We were standing on the plaza of the Supreme Court decision right after the landmark decision, uh, Webster versus Reproductive Health Services, that was the first major uh, erosion of Roe v. Wade. Um, and we were giving our, our statements to the press, and I had preceded him to the microphones uh, to make my statement, and being impatient, the impatient man that he is, he decided that it was time for me to stop. I mean, right in the middle of my answering a question to the press, he decided that it was time for me to end my presentation. And so he stepped up to uh, my side, and he sort of pushed my arm once, and I sort of looked. I couldn't believe that somebody had pushed me. Um, and the next time, he pushed again. Um, and this time, with the push, he stepped up, began to step up to the microphone to introduce himself. And there was this little voice on my shoulder saying, don't slug him, don't slug him. Uh, there was a great temptation. I could see it on the nightly news, pro-choice, anti-choice leaders battling on the Supreme Court steps. Uh, but I thought that it was so symbolic of what this business is all about. And it is the business of, of women not having the choice to be respected and to be honored until they, their wishes were fulfilled. And in that case, my statement was completed. And so I think that women's leadership must be felt. I don't believe that it's the exclusive purview of the national platform where I had the opportunity to serve, but collectively in our everyday lives, in every aspect of our lives, to understand what's going on, to be informed, to work without apology in the interest of women, to resist those who say that feminism is a bad thing, that the connotation of feminism is unacceptable and undesirable. Feminism is working in the interest of women that we not be denied opportunity because of our gender. Those who have gone before us have placed, given us a place at the table, and that place is not uncontested. And so we must recognize the important contribution and the, the tremendous debt that we owe those who are willing to advance the vanguard and to open the opportunities that we now enjoy. I believe that taking responsibility means that we're going to have to ask some very, very important questions over and over again. Taking responsibility means that we have to ask ourselves why women remain so unequally represented in political, educational, religious, and corporate institutions. Taking responsibility means asking why the Center of American Women and po Women in Politics at Rutgers University has estimated that it will take 410 years before the proportion of women in Congress equals our percentage in the overall population at this rate. Taking responsibility means asking why there is no 
national, serious national debate about the issues that women face in the workplace and the balancing of those issues in our lives and how our national policies can support women in the reality of the 1990s, not the perception or the perceived romance of the early, early 1900s. Taking responsibility means asking that after a generation of legal birth control and abortion rights, why are we still fighting and why are we losing ground on the most fundamental aspect of the control and the power of our bodies? Taking responsibility means asking why political leaders stoke the powers of fear and stoke the powers of gender and race bias when in fact we should be addressing how can we, be, how can we create more opportunities and broader opportunities, not how we can keep others in their place and deny the support systems that will help them and will give them a fighting chance to achieve a decent life. At the end of my book, I have written my book, Life on the Line. I have written a letter to my daughter, which I'd like to close these comments with a few passages from that letter, because I'm often asked, what can I do? What, what, what should I keep in mind? What does it mean for me as a young woman? And she's a 21-year-old college student, and I felt it was really important to say a few things to her that may not have occurred to her. Although, if um, I think you can imagine that I am like most mothers, um, I'm sure she can imagine what I had to say, because I've said it to her many times. But the suggestions that I left her with, I think, may be very useful to you in the ending of this prepared talk. I opened the letter by telling her a little bit about how I came to do what I did and what I see for her and my hopes and my dreams for her as a mother and why, I, in, in many ways, I committed myself so long to the struggle for this aspect of her control over her body, her reproductive rights. But I said to her, you've got to really take responsibility for this. And so I said, you must be informed. You must be vigilant. You can't defend your rights if you don't understand them if you don't know how you got them, and if you don't know who, who wants to destroy them. I hope, my daughter, that you will take nothing for granted, for you will not take pains to, get, to hold on to your rights if you don't understand that they can be taken from you. Do not shrink from power, Felicia. Feel that sense of power within yourself. No one can really take it from you. You have to relinquish it. Do not rely on the approval of others as your primary source of affirmation. You have that power within yourself to create beneficial change for yourself and for others. And I hope, my daughter, that you will not compromise your fundamental rights. Now, I was accused often of being a single-issue person, that there's more than just about birth control and reproduction, and I said, yeah, I'm guilty. I'm a single, I'm concerned with a single issue. There may be other people who are concerned with other issues, but this is really sort of fundamental. And so I said, I hope you won't ever compromise on these fundamental rights. Well, you know, we can give in here, let's find common ground. This is fundamental to who you are and how you conduct your life. And let me ask you this, Felicia. Would you be willing to sit still if the government took control of the New York Times, would you vote for someone who ran on that platform? Wouldn't it be unthinkable to you if each edition were reviewed by government censors? Well, my daughter, the sanctity of your body is no less precious. In fact, it is even more precious. Don't let anybody ever, anyone ever convince you that a cause cannot be won. It may take time and it may be painful, but nothing of value has ever been attained without struggle. And so much is lost when we cannot summon the courage of our convictions and step up to what we believe in. I hope that you will keep your heart open to an empathetic understanding of how you would feel if that were me. And remember one of your grandmother's favorite sayings, but for the grace of God, there go I. And don't be afraid to fail, because if you try to see your failings as setbacks and learning opportunities, it will give you the resolve to go forward. 
some of history's greatest advances have been born of frustrations and setbacks yielding to perseverance, sticking to it. And this is one that is especially dear to my heart, and that is that I hope that you will support other women in their endeavors. We must support each other when we speak out and when we challenge the barriers that continue to remain to our full achievements. I deeply hope that the women of your generation will be more mutually supportive than have the women of my time learned to be. And I want you to embrace every level of the political process. It's a ubiquitous force in our lives, and women must be reasonably represented. I'm not suggesting that women have to take over the government, but we must be reasonably represented and involved in every level of the political debate if public policies are to reflect the needs of your life and your aspirations, because we understand what the burdens are about. Do not allow yourself to grow weary of the struggle for equality. This struggle has endured for hundreds of years, and sadly I do not foresee it being achieved in our lifetimes, perhaps not even in your children's, but if your child sees you accepting inequality, where is the role model to continue fighting for equality? We don't give in to despair. We can protect those gains and make progress toward the day when your aspirations and your rights will no longer be contested because you are a woman. For change is rarely instantaneous. Now, this has been one of the most difficult lessons for your mother to learn. Progress often comes in increments, and there are gains and there are setbacks, and there are ebbs and there are flows, as though to entice us to persist. I hope that you will maintain your grace and dignity even when you are subjected to the most distasteful lack of civility, as I often was. Whether you like it or not, you are a role model and the conduct of your life influences others. What do you want it to exemplify? Are you willing? Are you living the message that you're willing to send? Not long ago, I asked your grandmother if she believed that the price she paid to pursue her mission was too high. And she said without hesitation, no, Lordy, I have no regrets. I would do it all over again. At the end of her life, in Ellen Chesler's excellent biography of Margaret Sanger, she wrote, Ellen, not at the end of Ellen Chesler's life, but at the end of Margaret Sanger's life, Ellen Chesler wrote, Margaret Sanger was often asked what she would like her life to be remembered, how she would like her life to be remembered. And Margaret Sanger said, I hope that I will be remembered as a woman who helped women. I hope, too, that I will be remembered as your mother as a woman who helped you to have a better life as a woman, for in you I see the future. And so let us rededicate ourselves to ensuring that these are the blessed times for women's equality and opportunity, because the future is in all of our society's members, including women. Thank you.